I'm continuing this week a series on alleged scenes in the Gospel of John. And you'll remember from last time that these scenes are supposed to be places where um, we can reasonably conjecture the involvement of at least one editor besides the author of John, maybe even multiple editors and layers of editing going on, um, and that they're switching things around, putting things together in a clumsy way, and even creating contradictions. So that's the argument that I'm tackling here, and I'm going over each of the places in a list. I'm uh, largely using a book by Gary M. Burge on the Gospel of John, Bart Ehrman has also made a big deal about these alleged problems and internal contradictions in John. I'm using Burge's book because he's taught at evangelical schools, so I want to show that it's not like he has any better arguments. In fact, Burge includes some alleged uh, seams that I haven't even seen Ehrman refer to. I may just have missed it, but he's uh, he's got a whole bunch of them that are that are not even, as far as I've been able to see, as common in the literature. The one I'm going to be talking about today is very common in the literature, and this is the argument that chapters 5 and 6 of the Gospel of John are in the wrong order. And I think that's wrong. I don't, I don't think there's a good argument that they're in the wrong order. And I want to clarify going in a comment that I made a couple of videos ago, and I didn't look up the exact wording of how I said it, but I said something to the effect that when we get to chapter 5 of John, we may have some of what I've called a chronological narration. And I, I want to clarify and to some extent correct that. Uh, John 5, 6, and 7 cannot be a chronological in terms of being in a different order, like the, the events didn't take place in this order because each of them begins with the phrase, after these things, John 5, 1, 6, 1, and 7, 1. So at least as far as the relative order among the events, the book is explicit. Now, they may be, in a, in a far different sense, um, quote-unquote a chronological, I probably wouldn't even apply the word here, just in the sense that other events can happen in between. They're not implying, you know, after these things doesn't mean immediately after these things. So, um, but there is an explicit assertion that the events in five occurred before the events of six occurred before the events in seven. Okay, um, I'm going to also mention here that if you want to follow this series, and especially this week's and next week's discussions, you might find it useful to listen at some point when you can have a Bible and actually, you know, look at what I'm talking about because it's a sweep of three chapters and the argument for reordering two whole chapters of material. And so I can't obviously read all of the things there or even summarize everything that's taking place without lengthening the videos too much. So I'll be referring to the events rather briefly and you might want to look, look them up in a Bible. Okay. Now, this one is kind of a biggie. Uh, those who argue for seams in John will often argue that chapter 5 and 6 are in the wrong order. Chapter 5, broadly speaking, is the story of Jesus' visit to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. It doesn't say which one. That's kind of unusual. John will usually say exactly which one. Uh, this one, maybe he didn't happen to remember, which is hardly remarkable, but a feast of the Jews, and he heals the man who's lame at the pool of Bethesda. And then the uh, religious leaders are angry because he healed on the Sabbath, and he told the man to carry his cot after he was healed, and they are going to plot to kill him. And Jesus starts talking about his authority as the Son of God. So very briefly, that's chapter 5. Chapter 6 is uh, devoted to the feeding of the 5,000, and then the um, one of the walking on water incidents as the disciples go back across to Capernaum, and then Jesus' bread of life discourse in a synagogue in Capernaum. So that's those are the events of, of six. 
All right, so five is in Jerusalem, six is in Galilee. All right, um, so if they should be reversed, if, they, if the events really happened in the opposite order, then that would be at least an error because of the use of the phrase after these things. But I don't see any reason to accept that. I, I think they can definitely be in the order that we find them in, in chapter 7, in the order in which we find it, even though there could be other things happening in between. All right. Um, so I should emphasize there is no textual evidence for this. It's not like we have uh, text families in which five and six are in the opposite order, nothing like that. It's entirely a, a sort of a literary critical uh, argument based upon supposed, you know, problems that are created by the present order, which is a lot more subjective than actually finding some sort of textual evidence where they're in the opposite order. So one argument that Burton signs on to is what I call a sorting argument. So this is an attempt to put as many as possible of the Galilee stories together and as many as possible of the Jerusalem stories together and taking that to be some kind of improvement on the order in which John gives it. And there's just no good reason for that. Um, why, sh why should we not think that Jesus alternated at times between Jerusalem and Galilee? Why try to, you know, all the Galilee over here and all the Jerusalem over here. What's the advantage of that? Well, here's how Burge states it. This also harmonizes John's chronology with that of Mark, where events in Galilee are climaxed by the great feeding, and then the scene shifts to Judea. So what Burge is saying here is that Mark at least strongly implies that all of Jesus' activities, his healings, and so forth, uh, in Galilee took place without trips to Judea, without trips to Jerusalem, no interruption, Galilean ministry uninterrupted, and then that only after this one big Galilean ministry did the scene shift to Judea. But there's nothing at all in Mark that either says this or implies this. This is the sheerest argument from silence, and it's a very bad one. There's, there's absolutely no reason to give an inch to the idea that if Mark doesn't narrate more visits to Jerusalem, more visits to Jerusalem didn't happen. Um, in fact, we know that John has lots of things that didn't happen, all right? Um, I don't see Burge arguing that the raising of Lazarus didn't happen because it's not narrated in John. Uh, excuse me, because it's not narrated in Mark. So why couldn't there be a visit to Jerusalem that is not narrated in Mark, and then Jesus returned and continued ministering in Galilee. There's not even a need to think of this as a harmonization, because I would say there's not even a prima facie contradiction on this point between Mark and John at all. Um, moreover, as D.A. Carson notes about this argument, even if you switch chapters 5 and 6, you still find Jesus back in Galilee at the beginning of chapter 7, and apparently he's in Galilee for a while, because it says that he... Uh, at the beginning of chapter 7 that he walked in Galilee rather than in Judea because the Jewish leaders were seeking to kill him in Jerusalem. So uh, the sorting doesn't work at all unless you just like throw out entire incidents. And, and that's not what Burge is trying to do. He's just trying to trying to reverse, you know, schlep around uh, entire chapters of material. And then you've still got an implication that he was in Galilee for a while after that uh, at the beginning of chapter 7. And I'll be saying more about the connection of chapter 7 to uh, this suggestion of switching 5 and 6 next time. I'm not going to try to fit everything in today. Here's another Burge quote concerning this is the whole sequence of events from chapter 4 through 7. Jesus moves abruptly from Samaria to Galilee to Jerusalem, back to Galilee again, and back once more to Jerusalem without transitions, end quote. So that's what he says. He says he moves abruptly from each of these places to the other without transitions. This is a flatly inaccurate statement. It is almost as though Burge did not have his Bible open when he was making this statement. It's 
hugely exaggerated because there are transitions at every one of these points except one, which I'll get to in a moment. So like each one of these has transition. All right. Um, it's like he's trying to strengthen the case for some kind of problematic abruptness in the Gospel of John by exaggeration and, and apparently doesn't even realize that he's exaggerating. Um, Jesus is in Samaria in chapter 4 on his way to Galilee. He's been having this baptizing ministry in Judea. We talked about that in the last video. And then he's going to go to Galilee. And it says that he had to pass through Samaria. There's a very normal route. The pilgrims, Josephus told us, from Galilee to Jerusalem for various feasts passed through Samaria going that direction. Presumably there were, you know, routes, roads, and Jesus is taking that route going the opposite way. So the, the passing through Samaria is the transition. Um, and he spends some time then after he's met the woman at the well. So that's like a particularly long transition. Okay. And then he continues on to Galilee. So where's this moves abruptly from Samaria to Galilee without transitions? Um, all right. And there's no particular abruptness. He actually hangs out in he hangs out in Samaria for a few days, and then he's like, okay, we're going to go on, continue on to Galilee. All right. Um, then at the beginning of chapter 5, it says that Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast. Now, that's a brief transition to say, he, after these things, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast, but it's at least, you know, implying that the author's aware that he wasn't in Jerusalem previously. So, um, and up, by the way, doesn't mean north geographically. Um, it's it's probably a, a um, probably a usage that has to do with the geographical elevation of Jerusalem and also just the importance of Jerusalem. Okay, so there's a transition there at the beginning of chapter five. It's just a brief one. So, Samaria to Galilee to Jerusalem without transitions, that first to Jerusalem without transitions. That's not true either. Um, back to Galilee again. That's the one that doesn't have a transition. I'll talk about that in a moment. And back once more to Jerusalem. That's got to be in chapter 7, where he goes to the Feast of Tabernacles without transitions. That's the most jaw-droppingly inaccurate part of this whole thing. Burge is just on a roll, and he's listing all of these changes, and he throws without transitions into the sentence, even though the transition at the beginning of chapter 7 from Galilee to Jerusalem is, is, is hugely emphasized. Jesus has a whole conversation with his brothers about the fact that, you know, they're going to go to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles and We'll be talking about this next time that they're taunting him for uh, not spending from their taunting point of view enough time showing himself in Jerusalem and so forth. And then Jesus goes secretly, etc. So uh, you want to, without transition, what are you talking about? It's one of the most emphasized transitions uh, in, in the entire Gospels. It's a geographical shift. All right. Um, so, usually, John does narrate transitions, and, and this is kind of important. Um, the reason that the absence of geographical transition narrative or reference between the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6 is so noticeable is because it's the exception that proves the rule. I've actually argued that this is uh, evidence for eyewitness testimony that John is often with Jesus kind of looking in a certain direction. So early on, Jesus is planning to go to Galilee and he goes and calls Philip to come with him. So John's thinking of this from Jesus' perspective, planning to go to Galilee. Same in chapter 7. He's thinking he's with Jesus mentally, you might say, considering going back to Jerusalem. And I, I think that actually argues that he traveled with Jesus. So uh, we notice the somewhat abrupt transition from five to six just because we're sort of spoiled as we're reading John because John is so smooth. Um, arguably, John has the most geographical information, the most 
chronological clarity. Perhaps he's tied in chronological clarity with Mark there. And the most explicit transitions from place to place of all four Gospels. He certainly has uh, more explicit chronology and transitions and geography than Matthew or Luke. They tend to use a lot of uh, a chronological narration, a lot of chunking in and abrupt transitions and so forth. So, um, and yet, Burge says concerning John, the text lacks a smoothness that we have come to expect from a unified narrative, unquote. And I think what he's doing here is he's conflating a literally unified narrative where all the transitions are told and, you know, uh, there's crystal clarity on chronology, which we don't find in any of the Gospels, um, and a unified author. Those are not the same thing at all. In fact, in ordinary people's memoirs, they will sometimes jump from one thing to another. They will sometimes make unexplained allusions. We'll be talking about an unexplained allusion in a minute here. Um, and so that kind of literary smoothness is actually not required for a unified mind of the speaker or author. Okay, now the exception here is John 6, 1, and it says, Jesus went, uh, after these things, there we got that again, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, chapter 5 ends with him talking to the hostile audience down there in Jerusalem, and then chapter 6 begins in this somewhat abrupt way. After these things, Jesus went to the other side of Galilee, of the Sea of Galilee. All right, this is what Burge says about that. It is like reading a letter from a friend who has just described his vacation in Scotland salmon fishing. Then when you turn the page, he says, and after this, we crossed to the other side of Chicago. Now, that's exaggerated. Again, <clears throat> the frequency and the relative ease with which <clears throat> Jews of Jesus' time traveled back and forth, usually on foot, between Jerusalem and Galilee is not comparable to someone's traveling back and forth between uh, salmon fishing in Scotland and Chicago. So again, there's this tendency to make the case seem uh, stronger than it is, to make this transition seem more abrupt than it is. Now, obviously, a geographical transition back to Galilee has taken place that he doesn't narrate explicitly. But so what? Okay, um, he's getting on to the story. He just doesn't happen to mention it explicitly. Certainly doesn't mean that the chapters are out of order. Now, the reason that Burge argues that this means the chapter 5 and chapter 6 should be switched is because he likes the what he sees as the sm literally smoother and geographically smoother transition from chapter 4. Um, Jesus is on the Cana, Nazareth, Capernaum side of the Sea of Galilee to chapter 6, immediately went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, but that's a pretty thin argument on which to base swapping entire chapters. Now, here's a consideration about this other side. and what John means by the other side. We know from the synoptics that Jesus' base of operations in Galilee was often the city of Capernaum. We find Capernaum coming up repeatedly. Uh, he may even have stayed, it may even be that Peter had a house in Capernaum and that Jesus stayed there. That's a little conjectural, but it's pretty strong conjecture. Um, D.A. Carson suggests that the Capernaum side was more heavily Jewish than the Bethsaida side. That may or may not be true. I'd have to look into it a little more. But I think what we definitely can say is that the Capernaum side was what we might call more common in Jesus' Galilean ministry. It was a, it was a place where he more often was. But we find in Mark that there are all these crowds. That's part of an undesigned coincidence concerning the time, because John mentions it was the time of Passover. There were all these crowds over on that side of the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus takes his disciples and tries to go away in a boat to try to get away from the crowds. So both from the perspective of the 
of the commonness of his use of Capernaum and from the perspective of remembering that he was trying to get away, the phrase, the other side of the Sea of Galilee, is quite reasonable to come up in the mind of the beloved disciple, um, even if he hasn't been narrating events that took place immediately prior to that in Gal on the Galilee side. You know, Jesus has was in Jerusalem for the feast in John 5, implied he went back to Galilee. He did stuff in Galilee, which John doesn't narrate. And then the crowds got really bad around Passover time, probably in Capernaum, and they went over to the other side. Now, this is the kind of thing, again, that we see in memoir. I've called this kind of thing an unexplained allusion, though before doing this study, I had never thought of this as an unexplained allusion, the use of the phrase, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But in a way it is. If I say, um, I went to the other shell station today, and I'm talking to my husband, I went to the other shell station today. Well, he knows which is the other shell station, okay? But what if I'm talking to a larger group that includes people who don't know which one is the usual shell station, which one is the other shell station? I might not think about that. I might just say, um, yeah, so today I got some gas at the other shell station and just kind of go on because I want to tell about something. I mean, John's going to tell about the feeding of the 5,000, right? Um, and not think about the fact, oh, you know, they don't know what I mean by the other shell station. And I think that is what we have here, that to John, the beloved disciple, it's natural to speak of the east side as the usual side and, um, sorry, excuse me, the west side as the usual side and the east side as the other side. And so he just speaks that way. And notice that this is um, the way a person speaks who isn't producing a highly polished document. So it's exactly the opposite of evidence for the involvement of a non-witness narrator. Um, I think that very often we find that these kinds of literary theories, uh, higher critical theories, really miss that kind of evidence for a witness narrator because they're looking at the whole thing from the perspective of what they think it should be literarily. In fact, I'm, I'm not even talking in detail about something else Burge says about uh, the current order breaks up certain theological themes between chapter four and chapter six. Um, something about the, you know, the, the water of life and the bread of life. Like he thinks that the mention of the water of life in chapter five, the living water to the Samaritan woman should be sort of closer to the story of the, the bread of life. And notice this is thinking entirely theologically and uh, literarily without regard to the possibility that, you know, sorry, this visit to Jerusalem and the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda just did take place in between Jesus meeting with the woman at the well and Jesus bread of life discourse and John is telling it the way it happened. We don't have to see that as some kind of problem. It's certainly not a historical problem, even though it doesn't, you know, flow from the water of life to the bread of life as close together as a, a critical scholar would want it to be. How is this an argument that these events happened in a different order historically? It absolutely isn't. So there's a complete missing of the evidence for memoir, the evidence against a highly literary, highly polished production, and a lack of common sense. And that's what we're all about here at the Lydia McGrew YouTube channel. So we're going to come back next time and talk some more about the attempt to sort of move chapter five around and put it somewhere else in the Gospel of John, in the chronological order, and how these also lack common sense. So I hope you'll come back next time to this channel where we're making common sense rigorous.